very happy to uh, introduce to call <laughs> a Dr. Moshe Cohen to the stage. Uh, you know, in Hebrew, they say that people are never jealous in the kids and in the students. So we do know some counterexamples, but I'm extremely proud and maybe I extend it to postdoc. So this is going um, so uh, big, uh, big pleasure and also thank you for recommending some of the other participants here that we would know how uh, good they are if you don't recommend them. So thank you very much. And let's say uh, the ever genius of the two which might be wrong to another with respect to cost and market. Thank you so much, Mina, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Mina said, I was her postdoc, my first postdoc in Israel. And the um, experience was so great for me coming in as a math theorist. I got to go to our algebraic geometry seminar and learn algebraic geometry for maybe the first time. And I took all these other seminars in Colloquia, um, especially Common Core seminar. One of the great things about the Common Core seminar. So I was learning from people all over Israel about what kinds of things they were working on. And one of the things that they were working on was randomness, which I had not seen before in America. So it's a really eye-opening experience. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go in. Um, so just a few notes about grades. My grades are going to go from left to right, mostly so that they can fit on the page. Um, and then the thing that you're going to hate me for is that instead of your normal grade closure, I'm doing what I think of as like a flat closure. Um, so this strand, you can imagine it going to infinity or you can imagine it sort of bending around over here. Um, and we're always going to have this kind of flat closure. And I know that's going to be different from the grades that you're used to dealing with, but I promise that there's something useful that we can do. Uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, so yeah, this is a grade without crossing information. I'm not going to talk about single group of grades. Uh, you would just sort of try to make that one look like this. Um, so I'll talk about this work that's joint with Adam Lorenz at Master College. And um, let's start with what the genus of a knot is. We have the cipher genus is the boundary. Uh, sorry, the cipher genus, we take the knot, we take a surface whose boundary is the knot. And you can imagine this trefoil picture, like um, you sort of color in all these leaves. The surface that you get there is non orientable. So you have to do a little bit of a trick just to make sure that you do indeed get an orientable surface. And then you take the minimum genus over all such possible surfaces, and you get what's called the cipher genus. And uh, well, I don't know. Cipher wasn't the one who, who found it first, I guess, or who published it first. Um, but maybe we call it a separate surface because separate gives us an algorithm to always find. And I'll talk about the algorithm because it'll show up later in my talk. Uh, we find a diagram. So everything that I do is diagrammatic. And uh, you take an orientation of the knot. I'm only dealing with knots today, so there's no ambiguity about links. And then you choose an oriented smoothing that follows the orientation of the knot. So this could be either an over crossing or an under crossing, it doesn't matter. And what's left, if you do that for every single crossing, is you just get a bunch of circles. And this is uh, referred to as um, S is the number of cipher circles in this diagram. I'll use this a little bit later. And then each circle is going to be colored in with a disk, like the front side of the coin, the heads and the tails. And we're going to glue these little bands between them so that the heads on one gets glued to the tails on another. This is like a twisted band where the twist follows whatever crossing direction they have. Is that okay? I know not everybody is a not theorist. Um, Nathan Duckfield, so we heard during Sergei Bukov's talk during Mina's awesome conference this weekend uh, that not theorists think a big knot has 15 crossings. Um, and uh, there's a paper at the Sikora goes up to 22 crossings or 23 crossings. And that's amazing. Nathan Duckfield, together with possibly Malik Bobadin, who was his PhD student at the time, um, together possibly with some students, put together this data set that is just absolutely remarkable. So I took this slide from um, a slide that's available on his website with his permission. And 
they create this huge, huge, huge data set. They create these giant grid diagrams for anyone who knows what those are. And they use an algorithm to simplify it. And then they say, what, how many crossings does this diagram have? And they look for it on the list. So, okay, this crossing, this diagram has three crossings. We'll put it on the list. Well, this diagram also has three crossings. We're not going to repeat it. So they use some kind of rejection sampling. So this is experimental data. It's not, you know, proven to be, um, you know, necessarily the, the true picture, but it's just trying to give us an idea. So every single dot here, um, and the slides, they do genus, they do a whole bunch of other invariants. Uh, here, the red dots are the upper bound for genus, and the blue dots are the lower bound. Because it's kind of hard to get genus dead on. When those two coincide, we get these black dots over here. So if you believe this data cloud, which is a huge, huge data cloud, especially for not theorists who want to end like here, um, you might think that the genus of a knot grows linearly with respect to its crossing. I have no idea how one would prove such a thing. But magically, we're able to prove this for the setting of two bridge knots. And two bridge knots, um, one way of thinking about bridge number is by uh, looking at your picture and trying to count the number of local maxima. So like here and here would be the reason that we would have a two bridge knot. Um, two bridge knots are so nice. We also call them rational knots. John Conway studied these knots. Uh, and rational knots are so named because you could talk about a continued fraction expansion. And use that continued fraction expansion in order to, uh, it's finite because we're using it to draw the picture of a knot. And then you get a rational number, and then we associate that knot together with this rational number. So I will say that because so much stuff is already known about two bridge rational knots, knot theorists just use this class a lot in order to try to understand phenomenon that happens at more complicated levels. So I'm only going to restrict to two bridge knots. And then my uh, result is that the average cipher genus, uh, you give me a crossing number, and I take every single two bridge knot of that crossing number. I count them twice, and that's a little weird, and I'll try to talk through that a little bit. Um, it's going to grow linearly with respect to the crossing number, and I have a lower bound, and I have an upper bound. Uh, and both of these bounds are linear. So I'll now step into like a maybe 10 minute proof of this and then i'll sort of showcase little bits of it that are missing and then i'll proceed with filling in the details but if anyone wants to ask questions there'll be a couple places to present i need to run in a few minutes but two questions so there's a point branch problem of the previous problem the last case so hey these bounds become how the complex domain is lost three manifold i think right Amazing question, and oh, I'll repeat it. So, um, can we talk about uh, twofold covers of the, the two bridge knots, um, giving us lens spaces? Part of me developing this machinery was hoping that people who study lots of different knot invariants would be able to learn from it. So, uh, that's an invariant that I haven't really thought about yet, or a, a, a direction that I haven't thought about yet, but I will definitely take a look at it. Um, so hopefully once we outline this machinery, other people will be able to use it to do the things that they can have. Well, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Was that notion of complexity of the number? I mean, you know, Nathan Dunfield would be a good person to <laughs> maybe take this in some good direction. Yeah. So you guys uh, and Bruno. Uh, could take this possibly in some interesting direction, especially because a lot of this is just coming from it. Just a piece. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Specific question about two bridge knots. So, is, it, is every two bridge knot like achievable by like a four strand braid of black closure? Or um, or... I think we don't even need, I think just three strand braids. Um, and three strand braids, uh, you can get this kind of alternating okay, so picture. To, okay. Yeah, like this. Um, is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to think of like what's an example of a knot that's not two bridge. Uh, so all two bridge knots are alternating. So if you give me a non-alternating knot, I know it's not two bridge. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. The question was finding a knot that is not two bridge. 
Any uh, anything else? Okay, so let's see if we can walk through what's going on here. Um, oh yeah, go for it. If you take a connected sum of f of say very simple norm, would they fit in that bound? I was trying to okay, so um because you have strict inequalities as I was wondering, when, when does it eat if you have the connected sum of trifles? So it is if you do bridge number and connected sum. Ah, it goes up. So yes. Yes. So sorry for that. The, the, the real thing is that I would love to be able to extend some of these things. Um so, and so. maybe one day. It's okay. So I, I usually stick to studying prime knots and I I don't usually ask questions about connect sums. But great question. So only the type of maybe is a two bridge number. Only the single type is a two bridge number. You can do what I did. So the thing I've done is you can do the type of 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 the So all two bridge knots are alternating knots, and there's this algorithm, which I'm not sure who to um, give credit to, maybe it's Cypher. That if you have an alternating diagram, that the genus of that alternating diagram, or the genus of the knot coming from the alternating diagram is going to be crossing number and cipher circles, the number of cipher circles. So I just did a little bit of algebra so that I can put the number of cipher circles all the way on that side. Uh, then I have this lemma. So I released a paper in, in August on the archive uh, that counts the number of cipher circles in a very special diagram. And the special diagram is one that I drew in. Getting of the talk. Um, so, in part one of the talk, I'll spend time explaining these special diagrams. And in part three of the talk, I'll try to give you uh, some intuition why lemma one is true. Uh, this is one of the theorems of my paper. The number of sacred circles S is two plus the number of VB. So, I'll talk about VB in part three of the talk. V stands for viable and V stands for vertical. Um, I don't know. I just made up a terrible notation. So I'm happy to hear if you have better notation. So if I take 2 plus VB and plug it into here, I get this thing. So this changes to that, and then we get number of VB. I'm going to just take this thing and I'm going to put it on the next slide. So here it is up here. Now I want to take the average. So I'm just going to sum over all the genus of every knot for a given two bridge knot over all possible knots of a given cross knot. So then I take this thing and I divide it by the total number. And uh, so what do we get? We get one half C minus one because those are constant for a given crossing number. And then we get number of VB over the total. And I just want to take this and isolate it. And I'm going to put this on the next slide. Um, so if you wanted to study the total number of these knots, Ernst and Summers have this big paper. Um, not only do they answer the question of how many two bridge knots have a unit crossing number, but they answer it twice. They answer it if you think of the trefoil as one knot, or you think of the left handed trefoil and the right handed trefoil as two different knots. So they have, like, their, their um, write up is not amazingly condensed. So I didn't want to put it on the slide. It's like a long theorem because there's something like six pieces. Um, so later I'll get to this total counted in a slightly different way and um, won't have to write down on the slides what they have come up. So here's this thing that we care about, number of VB over the total. And I'm going to just try to do some bounds. These are very bad bounds. Um, I can get them a little bit better and by the end of the talk I'll get them a little bit better. Um, but probably someone who you know, cares about balance better than me, you know, get them a lot tighter. Uh, so I'm going to compare total to total star. And total star will show up in this talk. It's the number of terms, so I'm going to call that T for terms, in an abridged list. And this abridged list is super weird. I know it's not natural, but I'll talk about that in part two. The nice thing about this abridged list is it has a really great and easy formula, and so I want to use that formula. Uh, it's basically two to the c minus two over three. So I'm going to compare this total, and it's going to live in between total star and twice total star. And then I can just put a t of c and a two t of c. Um, then on the top row, this vb I'm going to compare to vb star, which is something that I can compute a little bit easier. That's vb for the total on this abridged list, which is not the complete total. 
Um, and then it turns out I have some nice bound here and I get something like this. And so here this is, you know, sort of just just a bound. I mean, it could be better. Um, and then on this side, this technique doesn't work using this VB star. And so then I got stuck and I actually had to figure out what VB was. And uh, then I get this. So I can improve this bound by plugging in the actual VB over here. And then you go ahead and plug it in and you get that the average genus is in between two minimum things. That's the, the proof. Um, this is part four of the talk. So when I get to there, I'll go over the details more over there. Um, and uh, I'm happy to move on. But if anyone wants to ask, Ask any questions? I, yes. I know you said this like two minutes ago. So, what are we averaging over? If I give you a number of crossing, you're going to write down. So, I'll, I'll do this in the talk, but you'll, for example, I'll give you C is equal to seven, and I'll say, let's find all of the two bridge knots of crossing number seven. So, not every knot, but just two bridge knots of crossing number seven. I'm going to compute the genus for each of them, and then I'll take the average genus. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the crossing number is over all possible diagrams. So you have a specific diagram for a knot. So this is a theorem with the fact or not that minimum crossing number is achieved in this two bridge path. I'm going to exactly get to that. And the reason for that is all these two bridge knots are alternating. And once you have an alternating diagram, you know that that's the minimum crossing number. And so I'm going to take my, um, I'm going to show you how to create some kind of combinatory word. I'm going to take that word, turn it into an alternating diagram, and then we know automatically that that's going to give us the, the right thing. And then we, we can go back to this formula, which only holds for an alternating path. And so, really, I'm using so much of the literature about two bridge and alternating knots that I don't think that I could recreate any of this. Thank you. I'm at this from the lens of the geometry. So, so one of the ways avenues of geometry into not here is to look at the knots the links that come from singularities and not very a little familiar. So uh, I'll say it just out loud the knots and links that arrive as, uh, around singularities and not very curves. Yeah, so is there a relationship between these two sort of can you when something is two bridge, is there a relationship about the singularity? When something is, is there a relation between the, genus, the cipher genus and something about the singularity? Unfortunately, this is not my main area. Uh, although while I was in Israel working with Nina, I did get to go to Europe uh, several times and have really interesting conversations with not theirs there who care a lot more about this. I think also we got had some conversations with them and some of these algebraic curve kinds of questions. Well, this, I, I think minimum fiber serves as the existing genus. Minimum fiber is yeah. the yeah. exact genus. Yeah. It's the genus of the genus. Is this the, like a compound you're checking by the yeah. yeah. small stack? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, as usual, I don't know enough algebraic geometry yeah. to answer your question, but I hope that it's not so close. This is what the issue. Okay, I don't know the enough to teach the details of this. Okay. What is the class of singularities uh, which correspond to bridge two bridge no? Yeah, I don't know that. So I, I just don't know the answer. It's probably impossible to tell. What you have is that is that state. This is why I like coming to these conferences where we all have different areas so that I can teach you something that might be useful or that doesn't really And you try to ask me to you know, who are you? So, for example, in the I'm going to try to learn from you a little bit more during the conference and I'll keep going for now. Um, so I have part one, two, three, and four of the talk where I'm just going to fill in all those details of what you do. But so good what you said, oh. what you said that it's a double problem because it's always less space. 
I think that's what Alex said. Oh, okay. So he plays the kick. Okay, that's very strong transition when it comes to the area. The two bridge knots are not painting a giant picture of knot theory. Mm -hmm. um, they're just an accessible version of knot theory. Um, so that's a lot of the work. Uh, so these knots are parameterized by Chebyshev curves in um, three dimensions. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a little bit what that means. Uh, these Chebyshev knots were developed or were introduced by Fisher, but were really developed by two Parisian mathematicians, Pierre Bonson Kostelev and Daniel Pecker, uh, who really have like um, four, six, some huge number of papers, all really explaining a lot of these details. And so I used a lot of the stuff that they had sort of narrowed in. One of the really amazing properties of this is that there's no twist diagrams. Uh, sorry, there's no twist regions. It's like a single crossing and then a single crossing, a single crossing, a single crossing, kind of like a zipper or something like that. And um, it's just a different way to present knots, a different way to present braids. And I thought maybe it would have applications in things that you might care about as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a paper that I wrote on this subject some years ago. Uh, then in part two, I'll talk about this abridged list, that little asterisk with P of C, and we'll get to some formula for P of C. Um, I won't tell you about the results that I have uh, with Haim Evan Zohar and Sundar Krishnan, um, but I'll tell you some of the machinery that we use. And uh, Sudar was a PhD student of Robert Adler, who I worked with at the Technion after I worked with Nina. And Robert was a probabilist who said, I want to bring together topologists and probabilists to try to teach each other things. And one of the really big things was do the local coming from the probability and try to use that to tell us something about the global, um, which not only showed up in these two papers on randomness, but is actually sort of a theme for today. I'm going to try to do some local count and see how they contribute to the global average. Um, so uh, we wrote a paper that didn't have a great formula. And then we talked to Hayek and Evan Zohar, who's trained as a combinatorialist. Uh, I think now has a tenure track job. Um, so congrats to Hayek. Um, and uh, he, he, at the time, he was a PhD student also in Israel at Hebrew University. Um, so he really helped with that. Uh, and then in part three of the talk, I'll get to level one, talking about this BB star. And then in part two of the talk, I'll talk about level two, that was that big inequality. And I'll get to a number of other things. Anything you want to ask? These knots that I'm drawing here are going to be motivated by the study of least situ knots. And you might think about least situ curves or least situ diagrams. I think I first saw them on these oscilloscopes, if I say that word, do people know what I'm talking about? It's like this old electronic device where you turn the knobs and you make a little green dot draw pictures that are beautiful. And the, the best way to draw pictures is using cosine and sine and cosine to you know, have these nice things. Um, uh, and it turns out that if you parameterize in X, Y, and Z all by cosines, you get these beautiful three-dimensional pictures called Lisa Junots. Uh, that were studied by many fitness people. So Yosef Shikitsky, huge name in knot theory, he organizes a conference for grad students and young mathematicians every semester for the last like several decades. And announcement, there's a knot in Washington. <laughs> they go. Um, uh, and also Vaughn Jones, who was uh, you know, a hero for us in knot theory, um, fields medalist, who unfortunately passed away um, in recent years. Um, so these knots were studied by really, really famous people, but unfortunately not every knot is least to you. Uh, so here's a trick. We're going to turn them into Chebyshev knots. And the way that I do this is I use the A, B, and C Chebyshev polynomials. And maybe you've seen Chebyshev polynomials coming from like a combinatorics, undergrad combinatorics thing where you're talking about like a nice recursive formula. But if you haven't seen them before, the important thing is that they just interact like cosine. And so you can see here, we go up and down and up and down. We go forward and back, and forward and back. Um, and also, so if you could see this in three dimensions, it would be the same. Uh, so Pierre Monson, Koslev, and Daniel Pecker show that every single knot can be drawn this way, which is good because now I want to use it as a knot. 
In particular, they also show that this bridge number is controlled by A. So when I take A is equal to three, I get all two bridge knots and one bridge knot. There is only one on one bridge knot, and it's the unknot, which is just like a rubber band uh, that is not knotted. So when A is equal to five, I get three bridge knots and two bridge knots and one bridge knot, or the unknot. Uh, so what I really love about these knots is that I can snap them onto a grid. And if I go to this corner, so A and B are the A and B Chevy Chef polynomial from before. And if I just fire a billiard ball at 45 degrees and have it bounce through over here, as long as A and B are relatively prime, it's going to pop out one of the other corners. Um, and I only care about knots. I don't care about links, so I only want to consider A and B to be relatively uh, now you take all of these crossing, uh, all of these shadows here, and we have to turn them into crossings. And one way to do that is to figure out what C and P are. This phase shift from here. Uh, but I don't like to do that. Instead, I'm just going to order these crossings: one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going to create the string of pluses and minuses. And due to my really weird convention, I'm going to call this one plus because the the overstrand has slope plus one. I'm going to call this minus because the overstrand is slope minus one. Arbitrary missing doesn't really matter. Um, so now I'm going to be studying strings of pluses and minuses. And luckily, these are combinatorial objects of which a lot is known thanks to Chaim for sharing all that information with us. Um, I used these models to do the Jones polynomial, Jones polynomial of two bridge knots, there's like 12 papers on that subject, but Jones polynomial of three bridge knots, there was no paper on that subject before I, I put it on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take A is equal to three to give me two bridge knots, and I'm going to take B is equal to N plus one, so I have N crossings, and I'm going to look at a string of N um, coin flips or pluses and minuses. So Sunder and Chaim and I, we know that the prob we know what the probability of a given knot appearing somewhere in this model is, and we know what the probability of a knot with a given crossing number appearing in this model. But I'm not going to tell you about this. One of the so now we're moving on to part two. One of the tricks that we used in order to get those results, uh, I call them internal reduction moves and external reduction moves. And I'm going to think back to Sophia's great talk uh, where she showed us the Reitermeister moves. And um, you can think of these as kind of like Reitermeister moves, but for the class of um, billiard table diagrams or Chebyshev knots, because they don't they preserve that structure, they don't remove that structure. Um, an internal reduction move, I call it because it can happen anywhere in my string. If I have three pluses in a row or three minuses in a row, I just delete that. So no triples are going to be allowed once I take this reduced word. Uh, so here's the picture, plus, plus, and plus. I want you to take your left hand over here and your right hand over here, and I want you to just pull this down and forward. Now, we all know for braids that you can't do that. Because if I twist one part of the braid, that, that's going to propagate all the way through. But because these are Chebyshev knots, there's only one strand that's going through. And so you're twisting everything around that one strand as if it were the axis. Is that OK? Um, so when we do this, this blue, when we go here and pull this forward, the blue strand comes up front and the orange strand goes in the back, and we remove these three crossings. Furthermore, this extra crossing over here, the next one, now gets moved down to the bottom so that we have up, down, up, down, up, up, down, so that we preserve that kind of back and forth path. So once we start doing reduction moves, no triples are allowed. This thing is called external because it can only happen on one side, like the front or the back. And when you have plus, 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 and I don't really care what the third crossing is, so here's plus, plus, I don't care. You can delete three crossings. First, you do right of Meister two and just pull this blue arc over. And then you do right of Meister one and untwist this orange one here. And then you get three crossings removed again. And there's this mod three that's going to show up. And this is exactly the reason why we have that mod three. It's okay. 
Uh, now I'm going to look at all possible reduced words that I get. And they're going to be some number of pluses, some number of minuses, some number of pluses, some number of minuses. But none of these can be triples by internal <laughs> reduction. And the front can't be a double, and the back can't be a double. So we get a single plus, then this could be a singular or double minus, a singular or double plus, et cetera, down to this. Um, so it turns out that every single knot has either four or eight reduced words. And I'm going to try to show you where they are. One of them is if you just take a word and take its mirror image, switch plus to minus and minus to plus, this goes from the left-handed trefoil to the right-handed trefoil and back. And I just kind of think of them as the same knot. So apologies for those who think of them as separate. Um, there is a trick to get two different reduced lengths. Uh, reduced length one mod zero, uh, sorry, one mod three and zero mod three. And I won't tell you that trick, but I'm going to restrict to just reduce length one mod three, and I'm going to remove the times two. Also, I'm going to restrict to starting with a plus, and I'm going to remove that times two. But the last one, I can't mess with it. And this is really weird. This is why I have an asterisk. Uh, when I have a word, I can read it forward or I can read it backwards. And it turns out I get the same knot. Because you can just take your picture and turn it upside down and get the same thing. And so the thing that um, I want to do is I want to just figure out what happens when you read it forward and read it backwards and get exactly the same word. Because when that happens, it's only appearing once on the list, not twice. So I call that a palindrome or palindromic. Um, and then the even case is a little bit different. So I'll ignore the even case. But so this is why I'm going to have each knot appearing twice on my list, except for palindromes, which are only going to appear once on my list. So I'll fix this a little bit later. But for now, this is what I mean by that asterisk. Uh, so again, we start with the plus. And we're going to have length reduced length one mod three. Um, it turns out that the number of these letters here is the number of crossings. And this went to Alex's question. I'll show you a little bit later how you go from this reduced word to an alternating diagram. And you'll see how a single will give me a single crossing, and also a double will also give me a single crossing in an alternating diagram. So if I wanted to try to figure out how many possible words for a given crossing number, let's start with C is equal to seven. C is equal to seven is already one mod three. So I need to add, I can start with a plus minus plus minus and have seven terms there. And I would need to add zero doubles. I would only have singles, but I could also add three doubles. I could also add six doubles as long as I preserve this length mod three. And so what is K? Well, K is going to be C minus two because where can I put the doubles? They can't be on the front and back, they're only in the middle. So then I use this result from Neto, which basically counts the number of two bridge knots appearing on this list, which is a weird list. So it's not the exact count of two bridge knots. Is that okay? Um, so we get roughly one third two to the C minus two, which is the thing that I gave you before, plus or minus one. We call that TC, the number of terms on our bridge. So now in part three, I'm going to take that reduced word and turn it into an alternating diagram. And the way that I do this is whenever I have a single plus, I'm going to turn that into a sigma one, which I'm viewing kind of at the bottom row right of this brain horizontal. And whenever I have a single minus, I'm going to call that a sigma two inverse. Now there's some, I, I'm not just arbitrarily deciding this, it just happens to come out that way when I draw it this way. Now here's a double plus and a double minus, and there's a trick which I'll show you on the next slide, which is going to turn two pluses into a single crossing, which is a sigma two minus. So double sort of takes you up uh, if it's a plus, and double takes you down if it's a minus. All right, so here is a picture of that proof. If you have a plus plus right here, you can again grab hold of this with your left, grab hold of this with your right, and pull forward. And when you do that, this strand goes in the front, and you get this strand going in the back over here. All right, so you end up with two crossings turning into one, and it turns out that we get this nice alternating diagram. So here's like the minus minus three. 
There's some other steps in this group that I'm going to. Now we have our alternating diagram. So let's get to this work on uh, counting the cipher genus by counting the number of cipher circles. And this is going to take us to level one that I introduced you before. So level one says, Says the number of cipher circles is two plus v v. So the number of vertically smooth crossings that are viable. And here's what I mean by viable. I know it's a little weird. That's why I just called it viable. When I have two vertically smooth crossings that are right next to each other, the one on the left is which is left. The one on the on your left is going to be viable. When I have a vertically smooth crossing and the next vertically smooth crossing is at a different height, the one on the left is not viable. I know that's super weird. I'll show you at the end of this section, I'll show you uh, some examples where I go through why that trick doesn't happen. Um, so, ultimate, so ultimate, ultimately, I would like to count the number of viable vertically smooth crossings, and I'm not going to be able to. Um, do that so easily. So I'm lazy and I just take a bound by counting the number of vertical crossings, uh, which is a little bit easy. So here's the idea of this proof. Uh, if you have a complete, like let's say uh, the identity grade, there are no vertically smooth crossings at all, everything's horizontal. And then I just close this kind of like the picture that I had before. Oh, sorry, I'll close it like this. I'll close one strand here and I'll close like this. And I get the plus two. So this is kind of like a base case. And the base case gives me plus two, but I'll show you in some examples where that comes from as well. If I have two uh, vertically smooth crossings right next to each other, you can see that this one kind of caps off the circle here. And so two vertically smooth crossings next to each other creates this new circle. So this is like the inductive step where adding a crossing creates a new circle. Um, and then I'm not going to show you in this proof, but I'll show you an example of what happens if they're not fine. Um, so my goal is to now count the number of vertically smooth crossings. And before we get there, I'm going to look at the orientations of all those crossings, even before I decide which crossing I'll put there, whether I put this crossing or this one. And when I was computing Jones polynomial, I noticed this fact to help me count ride. And so I'm going to use it here. Forget the, the orange for a second and just follow along the arrows. Really easy. And notice that we bounce like this. So now let's add plus three on our reduced length. And when I do that, you can see that I bounce here and come back and continue in the same direction. And what's really cool about this is that I can just extend this over and over again. And as long as my reduced length is one on three, it's going to go h, b, b, h, b, b, h. So here, this one is horizontally oriented. This one is vertically oriented, vertically oriented, horizontal, b, b, horizontal, b, b, horizontal, etc. as long as I'm done. So the next goal is I'm going to take my decision whether I have a plus or a minus. This was a plus, plus or a minus. And I'm going to overlay that on this information and determine whether I have a vertical smoothing or a horizontal smoothing. Is that okay? And now I'm getting in the weeds of the talk. Don't worry, there are more weeds after this. But I have, I do have some pictures, so I'll explain uh, what's going on. So this. I'm going to use delta as like delta is equal to zero or one. Zero if we have a horizontally smooth crossing. The, uh, sorry, one if we have a vertically smooth crossing. Um, and I'm only going to worry about, for a minute, I'm only going to worry about counting vertically smooth, and I'm not going to worry about black. Uh, and this will be like a bound that I get. So the single plus and the single minus, as long as they line up with the Vs, they're going to count one. And if they line up with the Hs, they count zero. Now, the double is a little bit tricky. I have to use that technique that I showed you before to turn two crossings into one. And then I just do a bunch of casework. So this thing is kind of like just figuring out the casework, not all that complicated. Um, so this scary thing is the main theorem of this, or one of the main theorems of that paper. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to only look at this bridge list. I'm going to only count the vertically smooth instead of the viable vertically smooth. 
that's going to give me a low, no, an upper bound on the number of dB, and it's going to give me a lower bound on the genus. So then I get that the average genus on this bridge list. Here's that C minus one over two, and then we have minus one over two, and then this thing is one over the total. Uh, and then this thing is just dB. And um, I'm sort of proud of this. So I'll, I'll try to explain what's going on here. Instead of counting, the average genus for this knot, for the, uh, sorry, the genus for this knot, the genus for this knot, the genus for this knot, the genus for this knot. I'm going to say, let's look at crossing number one on every single knot on my list and figure out whether it contributes to genus or not. So, does this contribute? Does, oh, sorry, number one. Does this contribute? Does it contribute? Does it contribute? Does it contribute? Then we move over to index two. Does this contribute? Does it contribute? Does it contribute? Does it contribute? And we continue. So the first sum is counting this index, and it turns out index i is equal to one, and index i is equal to c count zero, never count. So I didn't even include that on the list. Then this is counting the number of doubles before i, and this is counting the number of doubles after i. And so it's a little bit complicated this way. Um, so can I show you pictures instead of this gross formula? Let's say C is equal to seven. I'm going to write the complete list of all of my reduced words. This is actually only half the list. I'll show you the other half in two slides. For every reduced word, I just create this alternating diagram. Notice that we have plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Sigma one, sigma two inverse, sigma one, sigma two inverse, sigma one, sigma two inverse, sigma one. And then I've done all the orientations on it and I figured out the cipher source. Uh, and if anyone studies not theory, here are the numbers of the knots uh, according to the labels. So now I'm going to color this. And on the left, I'm going to color by the vertically smooth crossings. And on the right, I'm going to color by the number of circles. So let's see if we can form that connection. Let's start at the bottom. We see here we have one, two, three, four vertically smooth crossings, which I've labeled for you. Well, this one is going to relate to this little piece here, and this one is going to relate to this piece, and this is going to relate here, and this is going to relate here. So we can see that these four crossings, vertically smooth crossings, contributed to four ciphered circles. And then here's the plus two. And you can see that the plus two holds in every single case. Um, so here there's two, and we get two. Here there's four, and we get four. Now, this is the weird thing about the viable um, case. So here, this one creates this, but this one creates this, and this does not give me a new circle. So it turns out whenever you have something that, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, right next to each other, but whenever you have a vertical here, followed at, at some point later by a vertical down here, or vice versa, then uh, you only count the first one, and that's what I mean by viable. But this theorem that I had pretended, I don't care, I'm just going to count for it. Did everyone follow this okay? I know that's a little bit confusing. I do like pictures. Um, so here is the second page, and here is the, uh, the rest of the list. So the cool thing that my theorem does is it says, well, let's just go down the list. Number one doesn't contribute at all. Number two, for this half of the list, doesn't contribute. Number three, doesn't contribute, doesn't contribute, doesn't contribute, plus one, plus one, plus one. And then we would get something like that. So I, uh, as we move into part four, I was just ready to get this out before the semester, you know, submitted it and everything like that. And I don't usually think about computer stuff, but I asked Adam who definitely thinks about computer stuff. And I said, do you think like, I don't know, it's worth calculating any of this or can I just, you know, put out the paper? And um, he said, well, put out the paper and I'll, I'll have some time later and I'll try to code this up because I'm vacation at the time. And in a few days, uh, eventually later in August, he took this whole big thing and he put it into code and this is the answer that we got. And then I, stopped preparing for my classes and spent the entire early fall trying to uh, figure out why we get this beautiful line here. Um, so, I mean, come on, this is, I, I don't even know. So at the beginning, it's a little wobbly. Um, 
And then over here, we have like, I think what's going on is a sawtooth. I think there's actually two lines here, one for odd and one for even, although it's a little hard to see. Um, so Adam was like, okay, there's something here. Like, what's going on? Uh, and then we couldn't really figure it out from this line. So instead of doing the whole thing, he just focused on this stuff here. And we got an integer sequence. So what do you do when you get an integer sequence? Type it into the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. And we got a hit. So um, we looked at it and we said, oh, and is there a media connection between what we're doing and what's written on OEIS? The answer was no. Uh, well, it turns out there was an exact formula, which was really, really helpful. So I used that, um, but uh, still couldn't exactly prove that what we were getting was exactly this thing. So I decided to look up the recursive formula for this thing on OEIS and then try to do some recursion. And now Adam was bad at me because years and years ago, he told me, is there some kind of recursion here that we can use? And I tried so hard that I could see it. But now for this project, I've done so many examples that I was able to figure out the recursion. So I'll tell you a little bit about that recursion. Okay. Um, the final crossing is always a single minus. Uh, let's just take C to be even. It's either a single plus or a single minus, but when C is even, it's a single minus. Let's look at the two terms right before that. We either have single minus single plus, double minus double plus, single minus, don't break, you can see the four cases. Um, and uh, I took C is equal to six for an example, and this is a complete list here. And you can see this is case one, this is case one, this is case two, this is case three, and this is case four. The recursion that I can see before that was really easy is just, let's just take these three and delete them because we're allowed to preserve this kind of mod three occasion. So when I do that, I get down to this picture, which turns out to be C is equal to four. So I can go from C to C minus two by doing case four, or I can go from C to C minus two by doing case three. And in fact, we're going to get C minus two counted twice. And then these two cases together give me C minus one here. Um, so the trick, and this is the thing that I had no idea why to do, is to take minus minus and replace it by my, uh, sorry minus plus and replace it by minus minus and take minus minus plus plus and replace it by minus and then you have to change this minus to a plus. I don't think I would have seen that had I not written out way too many examples. Turns out this TFC is that Jacob Stahl is a Jacob Stahl sequence, which is that formula that I gave you here with that plus or minus one. So this is the base just list of terms. This is T of C on that abridged list. Um, but now what I do is try to figure out the number of vertically smooth crossings. So I look at each of these cases and I figure out when we have vertical and when we have horizontal. So here we have two verticals that move to nothing. Here we get two horizontals that get moved to nothing. Here a vertical horizontal. Well, I guess here we don't even count verticals, so that case is fine. Um, here, vertical, horizontal gets turned vertical. It preserves the number of vertical, so that's fine. And then here are two verticals that get deleted. And so we have to count, again, we're going to have twice the C minus 2, 1 the C minus 1. And then we get twice from this, and we get twice from this. So I just needed a lemma for case 1. And you end up with this nice recursion over here. Um, and this recursion matches the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Oh, sorry. We get this recursion. We build another sequence of terms. And it turns out this is the, the thing that Adam showed. Um, we get exactly the same thing. So then we're able to use this recursion for my setting. And it's the same recursion as the one that's on. The next thing that I wanted to do was try to uh, figure out VV star by using the same technique. And it turns out that both of these are viable. And it, this one is viable, but this one is really weird. Sometimes it's viable and sometimes it's not. This one is always viable and this one is always not. So if you plug all that in, we get another recursive formula for VV star, the number of viable vertically smooth crossings on my average list. Uh, so I cheat and just say, hey, check this out. 
VV star is greater than 3TC minus 2. That's a really lame bound, really terrible bound, but it's one that I use just to find the existence of a linear bound for genus. Uh, unfortunately, this number is not on OEIS. Come on, OEIS. Yeah. Help us out here. So uh, I got stuck. I didn't know what to do. And then I remembered my awesome uh, college professor, Matthias Back, who I had for some early classes. And I was going home over break for uh, first year of college. And he said, well, if you're not doing any math over the summer. Why don't you take this book home? And he handed me generating functionality, which you can find at generatingfunctionality.com. And I uh, found the generating functions for these things. Uh, I haven't really done generating functions probably since undergrad, uh, but this was a lot of fun for me. So I'm not going to show you what this looked like, but it turns out that uh, this kind of thing with the like plus or minus one, if I use plus one as a bound, I get something like this. And then I was feeling so good, I remembered undergrad combinatorics. <laughs> I said, well, let me just figure out, instead of VV star, let me try to figure out what VV is. And so VV star was twice every two bridge knot, except for the palindromes that only appear once. So if I add together one more palindrome, then I get everything twice. So let me try to compute VVP, the number of viable vertically smooth crossings for the palindrome. And that was a lot harder, but in the, anyway, I get a bound. And then I add those two together, and I get VV is less than this crazy thing over here. And um, then I get that uh, this thing is bounded by this nice linear term. So that takes us kind of full circle back around. Uh, let's see what we have. We have negative VV over the total. I can go in one direction um, by bounding total in between this total star and twice total star, and I have TFC and twice TFC. Um, and then this number of VV I keep over in this direction. In this direction, I use this really cheap um, bad bound, but in this calculation down here, I actually use the, the number of VV, which I figured out. Um, and then uh, TFC is something nice. Uh, which makes it easier to divide by. And then um, because this number is, this number is basically like one third two to the C minus two plus a smaller exponential term. And I didn't want to have to deal with that smaller exponential term. So this was like a cheap move for me. Uh, and then we get that the average genus over all two bridge knots appearing twice uh, on my bridge, uh, not on my average list, every knot appearing twice. Um, of a given crossing number C is going to be bounded between this thing and this thing. And I actually plug these things in 0.138 and 0.391. Um, I'm sure I could do better than this uh, if I was really concerned with tackling exactly the numbers. So if I don't know, people think that it's interesting, maybe we'll try to get slightly better bounds here. So that's the main result. I'll just close with some things uh, that I'm thinking about as we move forward from this. Um, I had this awesome undergrad, Keith Grover, who loves so many areas of math. So I'm not sure that I'm going to convince him uh, that grad school is right for him. He's interested in the math of sustainability. He wants to save the world. I support you, Keith. I'm pretty sure that uh, he's going to be able to bring his math and computer science talents to all these different things but I worked with him on the determinants of two bridge knots and he computed millions and millions of matrix determinants so um this he presented in April up to 22 crossings I'm pretty sure he went up to like 30 or 32 so not every knot but all the two bridge knots up to um, some number of crossings by this point by the time you get to 22 I think there's a million of them so I mean he just went up and up and up um, doing impressive work. Uh, so this is the histogram for 18. This is for 19, 20, 21, and 22. And these are in our school colors. I thought it was amazing for doing that. Um, this histogram is just like a giant, giant data dump. I have every determined, I have millions and millions of matrix determined. I have no idea what to do with this data. 
<laughs> like if I had a few numbers, I would start to compare them. Uh, but I don't know, maybe we can learn either from this data or from some of the techniques in the talk. I'm not sure which ones are going to like carry over or not, but maybe we can use some of those ideas. Um, and I would love to maybe involve like more students or statisticians or something like that to help me analyze this data. A not determinant is an odd positive integer. Is that right? Oh, or zero? Anyway, um, we get uh, all a giant data drop that I have not looked through. Um, and then with Adam, one of the real more important things that I wanted to look up was signature and wasn't exactly sure how best to do signature. The average signature over all two bridge knots is zero because the left handed trap oil and the right handed trap oil cancel out like it's minus and plus of the same number. So I have this idea to try to take the absolute value of the signature and then try to take some kind of average there. Um, this work also has like a local description, but because some of them are plus and some of them are minus, it's a lot more complicated. But I think this result is probably more useful for understanding the growth of other knot invariants for which we're not going to be able to use this, this technique to study. Thank you. Questions? Beautiful results. Yeah, can I ask? Uh, I I must say. I mean, these these tails go out, you know, very crumbly. So I kind of would think for some, but I, um, I mean, these are really spiky, and I think that part of the spikiness is coming because. Uh, not only are they odd numbers, but I think they're often going to be powers um, of smaller odd numbers. And so I'm wondering if maybe there's, instead of just writing out all the integers here, if there's some better way of writing out, I don't know, just so, you know, maybe if I only look at powers of three, or maybe, I don't know. Um, so something like that. Maybe the data would be a little bit crisper, but I'm not sure um, what the right way to think about it is until I look through the data. Um, and there's too many. Um, it kind of feels like this is just professional. Yeah, because if you look at the way they're 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 rational tables going side by side. Right? Oh, and pretzel knots are two bridge knots. Yeah. Um, great. Or multi single knots. Yeah. So it's like rational tables going side by side. So like I wonder if they can like both things work with rational tables and do a really interesting thing. Oh, for each piece. Yeah, and then build it together. I don't know how to find the units of. I wonder if that is that really why we're doing this or not. I mean, there's counting this at least like And go up to Montesinos. Yeah, Montesinos. Well, start with Christine, great suggestion. I hadn't thought about that direction at all. I think you're right, but that's a pretty great direction. Thank you. We have a question in the Zoom, I believe. Hey, Moshe, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how you doing? Uh, so I, I was just curious, wh wh where did you actually need the billiard Lisa Jew business at the beginning? Because it looked to me that you were just using the uh, kind of reduced continued fraction presentations to get the alternating diagrams. And then from the alternating diagrams, you got the cipher circles. So what, what was all the Lisa Jew business at the beginning for? Um, so at the very, I'm not exactly sure if I followed your question, but I'll try and let me know. Okay, if I'm okay. The early work that we did here involved this internal reduction loop and external reduction loop. Okay, but and the reason that these work, I mean, these are really pretty pictures. Sure. But this thing is a continued fraction, or, or a piece of a continued fraction, and this is a piece of a continued fraction. And yeah. the reason that this works is bolstered by results that already exist for continued fractions. 
And yeah. here, once someone slept in Daniel Pecker actually used the, um, like, I mean, continued fractions, people knew things, but once you have these continued fractions where everything is either a plus one or a minus one, uh -huh. uh, they used what was known about um, continued fractions, applied it to just the Chebyshev case. And when they applied it to just the Chebyshev case, they, they, I think they knew these results as continued fraction results um, and not uh, visually like this, but I usually present pictures. Did that answer your question? Well, I, mean, I guess my question was more like in your argument, where did you use any of this stuff about um, the billiard table structure? Because yes. uh, it seemed like you could just bypass that completely. Okay, so what I used about the billiard table structure was the ability to create the complete list of every two for each number. So I've published it. Can't there. you do that with the uh, continued fractions directly? That's that's what I don't understand, I guess. Um, so we're... So like the picture you had of the seven crossing two bridge knots where you showed the uh, diagram, alternating okay, diagrams and the smoothing. So yeah. what they did was I take the complete list of all two bridge knots by going through this. And here's how I create this list. I say, well, the first one is plus and the last one is plus. And then I have five in the middle to sprinkle doubles into. And I can sprinkle the doubles into them. Well, right now C is congruent to one mod seven. And so I can sprinkle in zero doubles or three doubles or six doubles. And so I use this technique to give me this complete list. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess I, I don't see, I mean, I guess that's a one way of doing it, but I, I think right here, what you're showing is that, I mean, what I see in the picture here is that that's just showing me the continued fraction. You could just get the same results straight, direct, just kind of directly. But maybe we can talk about that more another time. Sure, please get yeah. on me. I think that um, I because, think that there are definitely different ways of thinking about these things. I don't know. It, it might be the case that when I get to this result, that um, I wouldn't necessarily need all of that. But yeah. what I'm trying to do is because it was such a regular diagram and everything was so easy that I was able to use this okay. uh, one to figure out exactly what the contributions were to the ciphered circles. And I'm not sure that this theorem would hold for different diagrams. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know, maybe there's some, um, better way to do this, but I would have assumed that if a result like this existed already, or I would have assumed that if a result could exist, that someone would have found it already, and it was just that this was kind of a new diagram. But I'm happy, I'm totally happy to speak more uh, by email if you want. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the, the newest thing here is just go ahead and analyzing the, the, the relationship of crossing number to uh, cipher genus. I mean, so I think maybe just nobody well, y'all yeah, had the motivation for to do so long, but you're probably right. There's yeah, probably yeah. a more direct way that doesn't revolve yeah. more uh, that I previously done. But then, you. like with the determinant, I mean, once you have the continued fraction, you know the determinant just from getting the rational number. It's like the uh, denominator or something, right? Or the numerator, one of the two. Right. So, so, um, and this is what I did with the student before when I was doing all those determinants. Yeah. What ends up happening is that you repeat a lot of your knots. And so I wanted some way to control, because if you give me two rational numbers, um, there's some rules for when, or when they give you the same rational knot. Sorry, when you give me, yes, like you can have alpha over beta and then like negative alpha over beta. Sure. Like yeah, no, but you'd want to start off with the, uh, anyway, you would, you'd want to start off with the continued fraction not the rational number, because there's too many. Oh, yeah. So basically, everything was built from continued fractions of plus or minus one. But okay. I don't know. Maybe we could do something similar with John Conway's notation. And or something. Like okay. Yep. Um, please email me. I'm, I'm totally happy to. Sure, sure. It might be better than that. Okay. Very good. Any questions? Okay. Thank you.